would you? Wow. Great, thank you. So just get my uh, screen up and running here. Okay, very much thanks to our fearless and faithful AV crew who work miracles. Um, most people don't realize, but if you're actually there and saw all the balls that they are juggling every single uh, meeting to try and keep everything going, it's, it's amazing. So um, thank you. Um, I like using a PowerPoint. The, uh, they're simply my notes. For some reason, I think in point form. I don't know why. I guess my thoughts are just very short. Um, so that's why I think that way, and I figure, well, I might as well show you what my notes are. It might be helpful. Um, so thank you again uh, to the AV crew. And uh, maybe we'll just again bow our heads in a word of prayer before we begin. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for this opportunity to open up your word and, Father, to discover more in it. We pray, Father, that you'd open our hearts and our minds and that we ourselves, Father, uh, would open up these things as well and that, Father, we'd be open to your truth and most of all, we would open to obeying what we learned today, Father. Whatever the Spirit speaks to us today, we pray that we would genuinely and truly obey this and then practice it all to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Show us and teach us, we pray, Father. Lead us by your Spirit. We pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, so we'll be carrying on with uh, a study in 2 Timothy. Um, for those who might have been, uh, probably many of you were here when I introduced the series. I can't remember when. It was some time ago. So we'll do a, a bit of a very quick uh, review. Um, so I've sort of entitled the, this little series, 2 Timothy, Reinforcing the Foundation of the Man of God and uh, just to spend just a few minutes just kind of reviewing um, how we got here. I won't spend too much time but uh, again Timothy was uh, a companion of Paul, um, probably saved on Paul's first missionary journey and then on a, Paul's second missionary journey um, when he visited the same uh, Timothy's town, hometown, um, all the believers there even in surrounding towns uh, had nothing but good things to say about this exemplary young man. And so Paul took him uh, on his journeys from there and became more or less a spiritual father to him uh, for many years. And you steadily, as you uh, look at the life of Timothy through the scriptures, you see a steady progression from just a, a man, uh, a young man just dedicated to God, wanting to serve God, and uh, growing in the faith, at first just, you know, attending uh, or, or going on journeys with Paul and doing maybe more mundane tasks, uh, eventually uh, gaining Paul's confidence and in this case in being sent to Thessalonica. Uh, so from the first Thessalonians we read, therefore when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good uh, to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow labor in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith that no one could be shaken by these afflictions. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he had that utmost confidence he could send Timothy to an uh, assembly like Thessalonica, Thessalonica that had been shaken by certain things uh, to encourage them, establish them and encourage them um, so they would not be shaken uh, by those afflictions. But when we get to uh, that's before 8064. 80, After 8064, when 2 Timothy was written, uh, we find Paul writing this to Timothy. Therefore, I remind you to stir up or rekindle the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, 
nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in his sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Someone that was sent to establish and encourage assemblies now needed encouragement themselves. So there was kind of a pivotal point in Timothy's life, and it was AD 64. And if you recall, the event that changed things was a, a terrible fire that took place in Rome, destroying uh, a large portion of the city. And at that time, the Emperor Nero, um, for whatever reason, decided to blame Christians. It's it patently clear Christians were not to blame for that fire but they were a convenient scapegoat, I suppose, and so he started to blame Christians, and from that point forward, Christians became persecuted by Rome, the most powerful government, governmental authority on earth at that time. Um, <clears throat> before AD 64, it was definitely difficult to be a Christian. Um, you would have suffered persecution from Gentiles and from Jews alike, but there was some protection and tolerance from the state uh, of Rome. After AD 64, it was not just difficult it was actually dangerous to be a Christian, even deadly, uh, the perse now being persecuted even by the state itself. There was no, uh, other than uh, clinging to God uh, for his protection, there was no other protection outside of God in the world for Christians. And I think this shook a lot, and uh, we see example like Timothy, you can see that he needs to be reminded to stir up his gift. He needs to be reminded not that God has not given us a spirit of fear. He needs to be reminded not to be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner. And even to share in sufferings with the gospel, to accept his uh, share of suffering in the gospel with Paul. So this exemplary young man, which I think is an example to us, because uh, I don't consider myself to be anywhere near the level of a Timothy, yet even a Timothy could be shaken by this. And it was very serious. We actually see uh, at the end of the letter, Paul mentioning a man named Demas, um, who, has, who uh, abandoned Paul. We find out at the end of, uh, in chapter 4 of Tim 2 Timothy, this man Demas abandoned Paul because he loved the present age. And Paul had previously spoken of that man Demas as a, um, a, fellow, a fellow worker for Christ. And he, Demas appears in a couple of books, uh, uh, Philemon and... Uh, and Colossians. So it appears at this time it kind of was the great refiner, those who were maybe claiming to be Christians, professing to be Christians, but going along with it so long as persecutions uh, weren't severe and weren't pointed directly at them, um, those people were leaving the church. No doubt that would be a discouragement to many, uh, including Timothy. And then people like Timothy, a young man who's, you know, lived an exemplary life for the Lord, um, be shaking. He'd be seeing people leave. His mentor, Paul, was now in his second imprisonment. Paul had at least two imprisonments. Well, actually more than two imprisonments, but um, his first long-term imprisonment in Rome, uh, Paul was in house arrest, and he expected to be released, and he had plans for a mission beyond. Well, Paul doesn't have that in this this time, Paul's literally in a dungeon. It's literally more or less a cave with a hole at the top. Prisoners were dropped into it, and it was not a very pleasant place. And he was being held there for execution. And Paul had no plans of being released, and he had no plans for further ministry, but was committing uh, the things that, that, he, uh, uh, that he felt he needed to to Timothy, committing his ministry now to Timothy to pass on to others. So that's kind of where we find ourselves at with, uh, with Timothy. So he needed reinforcement. And uh, <clears throat> the idea of the foundation, because maybe my carpentry back, background is uh, kind of, you know, something that's always very vivid to me. But scripture does talk about a foundation. We we're told that we need to build on something solid, on solid ground. And, uh, you know, I think just simply of these couple of scriptures from the, uh, the book of Matthew, um, we're all familiar with everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise, wise man who built his house on a rock. And in Matthew 16 at Caesarea Philippi, Paul, Peter makes that great conviction, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Peter replies to him, and I tell you that you are Peter, stone, little stone, and on this rock, Peter's confession of faith, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. So. And we could think of many other scriptures that talk about building on something solid. And something solid, Timothy had a solid foundation, but even the most so solid foundation can be shaken by turbulent times. 
And so Paul was seeking simply to reinforce, not rebuild, not to build a new foundation, just to reinforce that foundation that he had built into T Timothy. And we looked at uh, five, uh, five foundational truths that Paul reminds Timothy of in 2 Timothy. And the first one is, of course, it begins with the gospel. Um, the foundation of a Christian begins with the gospel. It requires investors. It's strengthened by accepting suffering and persecution. Its usefulness is determined by purity, and it is completed by believing all the scriptures. And uh, we covered the first three in the previous two messages. Um, I was thinking of trying to, to uh, cover the last two points uh, together today, but as I was studying Timothy, the Lord just drew me in. And uh, so we're going to be stick with just uh, the fourth point there. Its usefulness is determined by purity. So we'll look at that today, okay? Um, so I think just very quickly, uh, the foundation beginning with the gospel, it is according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. And of course, there is no other foundation other than faith. By grace, you're saved through faith. It's not of, uh, not of ourselves, it's not of works lest anyone should boast. There is no other foundation than faith in Christ. If we don't start with that foundation, um, then we're not building on solid ground, as Christ said. He who um, hears these words of mine and does them, he's like a man who built his house on a rock. And uh, this faith required investors. And most uh, importantly, of course, is our heavenly invest investor. Um, God invested by giving us his son. Christ invested by laying down his life. The Holy Spirit is invested by coming to dwell inside of every believer. But beyond that, in a human sense, we have many investors as people of faith. And Paul points out people like uh, uh, Timothy's grandmother and his mother. They were fundamental and, and, and foundational to his faith. From the time he was a very small child, he knew the scriptures that were able to make him wise unto salvation. They were faithful in praying for him and teaching him and, and making sure he was... Uh, uh, making sure the scriptures were built into him. So it requires investors, and of course, we're called to be investors as well. Um, we need people to invest in us, and we are to invest in others. And then uh, the foundation is strengthened by suffering, and it's strengthened by suffering for one reason. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, a prisoner for his sake, but by God's power, accept your share of suffering for the gospel. And uh, so, you know, and you know, I know Kevin is more of a historian of the church. He'd be able to tell you many, many examples of the church, how it went through very difficult times of persecution, and yet they thrived in those times and uh, went all over the world. And we're, you know, we should be very thankful today that that is the case. So persecution does not weaken or destroy the foundation. It actually strengthens the foundation, but only if we're willing to accept our share of that suffering and when we do, we have the unlimited power of God, the same God that created the heavens and the earth, the same God that raised Christ from the dead. We have that power in us to um, go through sufferings and persecutions as Christians. So the foundation is strengthened by suffering. Then finally to today, our topic today, is uh, the use of this foundation that we have is determined by the purity of it. And a couple of verses, our theme verses maybe for today. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I'm going to read it in a minute in a different translation, but that's uh, from the New King James. So if anyone desires, uh, so if someone cleanses himself of such behavior, he'll be a vessel for honorable use, set apart, useful for the master, prepared for every good work, 2 Timothy 2.21. So that's going to be our, our kind of our theme for the day. Okay? Um, before we get to our actual verses, we'll get there in just a minute, um, I just want to highlight a couple of things. Um, there's two types of purity here in Timothy, and the first one is what I'll call doctrinal purity, and the second type is moral purity. And there's definitely a link between the two. Um, I just want to spend a, just a couple of minutes talking about that. So just doctrine, just backing up a little bit. Um, doctrine is not a common word in our everyday English language anymore. 
um, politicians use it to, you know, build themselves a legacy. This is the doctrine of so and so and foreign policy doctrine and so on. But doctrine in scripture simply means teaching. Um, it's something that you teach someone else. It also means that which is being taught. And scripture also uses it in the sense of learning. So someone's teaching, of course there's content that's being taught, but then people are learning, okay? So as a teacher, um, that's an important concept. Even here today, I'm hoping that you are all learning. Um, not from me, but from the word of God, from the Holy Spirit speaking to you, I hope you learn uh, from what God has brought forth this morning, okay? That's the end goal, and learning, we'll see in a minute, involves practicing. So um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to 2 Timothy 3, verse 10. Uh, this is Paul speaking. You, however, speaking to Timothy, of course, have followed my teaching, which means doctrine, my way of life, my purpose, my faith. If we examine Paul's teaching and his life, there is no separation between his doctrine and his practice. Okay? Paul's doctrine and practice were the same thing. That's the way it is supposed to be. Um, therefore, doctrine and practice are not separate things. We don't learn doctrine over here, but our practice is over here, and there's a wide gulf between them. Oh, yes, I know intellectually, I know all this teaching, but every day I do this. Well, I would like to put to you today that what we practice is our doctrine. We might have an intellectual knowledge of information over here, but what we're practicing over here, whatever we're practicing, that is our doctrine. That's what we believe. Uh, you know, maybe you might disagree with that. We could have a chat about it later if you like, um, but uh, I really believe that. What we practice is our doctrine, what we believe. We might say we believe this, but if we're practicing that, this is not our doctrine. Our practice is our doctrine. They're not separated. Also, um, I think uh, this book of Timothy is making a good point. Doctrinal purity precedes moral purity. If you don't know the plain teaching of the scriptures, it's pretty hard to follow that moral teachings in the scriptures. People think of Jesus as a, as a great leader and, and very loving, and so they like to uh, you know, look at only that aspect of the Lord Jesus. Oh, Jesus would never judge. He would never, um, I think someone today was in the news, I think, Marcia told me that someone made a comment that if Jesus were alive today, he'd be marching in a pride parade. No, he wouldn't. Yes, God loves, but he's also holy, completely separate from sin, holy, undefiled, harmless. That was our Savior. No, he wouldn't participate in that. No, he came to save sinners regardless of their sin. And um, whether it's adultery, fornication, um, lying, stealing, thieving, whatever it is, he came to save us from our sin, but he does not condone or approve of that, and he especially hates pride. He challenged pride at every opportunity. He called um, uh, Satan the father of lies, full of pride. So um, he wouldn't be marching in a pride parade, I'm sorry to say. Um, and that's an example of doctrinal. If you know your doctrine, then if you believe the doctrine, you'll be following that doctrine. It's where we have doctrine over here and practice over here that's the problem. So we need to know the doctrine before we can practice moral purity, and moral purity is the required outcome of doctrinal purity. So when we learn something, God requires us to do something. It's not an option. It's just, oh, well, that's nice, um, but I'm ta taking option B, other. Um, when God teaches us something, is trying to teach us something, and we learn something, then uh, moral purity is the required outcome of doctrinal purity. So it goes like this. We learn the scriptures God has given to us. In the scriptures, they contain truth. As we learn about that truth, that we're able to uh, determine doctrine, and then that doctrine determines our practice. That's the way it works. Okay? So that as we are looking at this particular passage in Timothy we're going through today, I want you to keep in mind, uh, Paul emphasizes doctrinal purity first, but then does talk about moral purity uh, next, and he's expecting our doctrine to be our practice.
Okay. And uh, just for time, we'll just skip ahead here to, uh, and you'll see the difference. There's going to be, he's going to show you examples of uh, why doctrinal impurity is so important. Okay. So we'll finally get to our text. Um, and it's uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. And uh, I'm going to read them in the New English translation because uh, I like the way it translated some of the words there, some of the verses especially. And if you're an outline person, if it's helpful for you to have out outlines, um, this will be our outline for this passage. Um, the doctrine to be pract practiced, the behavior to be avoided, the goal to be attained, and the people to be rescued. So let's read it here uh, quickly today. So uh, cha 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, Remind people of these things and solemnly charge them before the Lord not to wrangle over words. Um, this is of no uh, benefit. It just brings ruin on those who listen. Make every effort to present yourself before God as a proven worker who does not need to be ashamed, teaching the message of truth accurately. But avoid profane chatter because those occupied with it will stray further and further into ungodliness and their message will spread its infection like gangrene. Hymenaeus and Philetus are in this group. They have strayed from the truth by saying that their, res their resurrection has already occurred and they are undermining some people's faith. However, God's solid foundation remains standing, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from evil. Now in a wealthy home, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also ones made of wood and of clay, and some are for honorable use, but others for ignoble use. So if someone cleanses himself of such behavior, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart, useful for the master prepared for every good work. But keep away from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faithfulness, love, and peace in company with others who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But reject foolish and ignorant controversies because you know they breed infighting. And the Lord's slave must not engage in heated disputes, but be kind toward all, an apt teacher, patient, correcting opponents with gentleness. Perhaps God will grant them repentance and then knowledge of the truth and they will come to their senses and escape the devil's trap where they are held captive to do his will. And uh, we'll ask for the Lord's blessing on his word today. So we'll start with uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. And uh, this is our first part of our outline, the doctrine to be practiced. Um, Timothy, or Paul reminds Timothy to remind people of these things. He says two things in verse 14, remind them of these things and solemnly charge them. And these things were the previous verses from verse 11. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful since he cannot deny himself. And uh, for time, I won't go through these. We talked about these verses in our previous message, so I'll encourage you to go back to that recording, or we can have a chat about it after. But for time's sake, um, I think it's suffice it to say, as a Christian, these are wonderful verses to meditate on. If we die with him, we're going to live with him. If we live with him. If we endure, we'll reign with him. Um, if we deny him, those who renounce him, he will also renounce. That's very clearly taught in Scripture. If we are unfaithful... However, if we are truly faithful believers but just have stumbled um, and gone, wandered astray, he remains faithful since he cannot deny himself. Okay, so Paul, Second Timothy, uh, sorry, Timothy was exhorted to remind people of these things. And we can remind each other of these things. Uh, we'll have an opportunity this morning during the remembrance meeting of our Savior, what he's done for us, that we, the life that he has given us and the, the death that he died to give us that life. We can remind ourselves of these great truths during special meetings. Christmas, we have, Christmas, we have Easter me meetings coming up. Whenever encouragement is needed, whenever someone is discouraged or weary, these are great verses to go back and remind us of. Their, um, this is what they, I guess scholars would call a little a creed. It was something very easy to memorize and think of so Christians could, in times of trouble, quickly um, 
remind themselves of these things, and we should remind ourselves of these things today. So Timothy was exhorted to remind people of these things, and then also to solemnly charge them. So solemnly testify or solemnly give them, uh, you know, affirm to them before the Lord, uh, not to dispute about trivial things. Um, trivial things, uh, disputes of trivial things are never, there's never a good time for Christians to dispute them, but especially in times of persecution, suffering, and trial, and as the days grow darker, we don't have time to, to argue about trivial things. We need to keep the main things the main things. The glory of our God, uh, the furtherance of the gospel, we keep the main things the main things. There's many wonderful doctrines. I'm talking more about obscure doctrines, uh, matters that are unrelated to scripture or Christian living. Of course, we need good sound teaching on a wide variety of, uh, of doctrine. Um, but remember, um, you know, I've talked in a Sunday school class before about uh, the bullseye. And the bullseye at the very center of it is the person and work of Christ. And then as we go outside that, um, doctrines as we get to the very edge of the bullseye, bullseye are more, you know, doctrines that if someone claims that they, that, um, they have the truth on this, they have, you know, they're not telling you the truth because there, there's different interpretations. We don't know. Okay, but they're not essential to Christian living, but the person of work of Christ certainly is at the center. And so we start there, and as we get to these peripheral doctrines, there's good to meditate on and maybe learn something from, but we can't be dogmatic about, and we certainly shouldn't be arguing about them as Christians. Okay, and then of course we can argue over what makes up the rest of the bullseye, but again, we shouldn't be arguing. There's not enough time for that. Okay, Paul says there's a warning here. There's not not only is there no benefit to doing these things, it actually results in the ruin of those listening. So people, especially people that maybe are not established strongly in doctrine, maybe newer Christians or Christians that just haven't had solid teaching on certain subjects. You know, if we're arguing over things that are, are trivial, um, we can actually, you know, damage their faith. Paul talks very strongly that the ruin of those listening, okay? When we get to 2 Timothy 2, chapter 15, um, this is where God kind of drew me into the scriptures. Um, i kind of broken it down. I'm using the net translation, the New English translation. Make every effort to present yourself before God as a proven worker who does not need to be ashamed teaching the message of truth accurately. And i just like to look briefly at each one of these. Make every effort. Depending on the translation you're, you use, um, there'll be different words here. Be diligent, do your best, work hard, but they all have the same sense, don't they? Don't they? Make the best effort that you have, okay? Make every effort to present yourself before God. I don't think there's any wiggle room in that. Um, it's not something that you would take lightly. Make every effort, be diligent, do your best, work hard. Um, elsewhere in the scriptures, this same word is translated as eager, endeavoring, even utmost. Do our utmost to do these things. Strong admonition. To present yourself before God. I mean, ultimately, who is our service for? Of course, we remember that our job is to glorify God, to please only him. That should be our goal. Not, to, not for ourselves, not to be please other people, but we are to glorify our God, to please our God. So make every effort to present ourselves before God for his approval, okay? As a proven worker, and uh, this word proven, it means literally it was used of testing of uh, metal and coins. So sometimes they would go to the extreme case where they'd take silver coins and they weren't sure, they didn't feel right, they didn't feel like the right weight, they'd actually melt them and to make sure that they were actually pure silver. Um, so that's kind of where the word originated. It means proved, tried, approved after examination and trial. Proved by testing, genuine, or we might say tried and true. We can't be proven without enduring some kind of a trial. So that's the kind of worker that God is looking for, someone who can endure, and has proven they endure through trials. That's the kind of worker. Do you want to be that kind of a worker? 
James 1.12, happy is the one who endures testing because when he has proven to be genuine, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. There's a great encouragement in this, isn't there? If you are a proven worker, there is a crown for you when we get to glory. And it's no small thing to have the creator of the universe present you with a crown of, a, a crown of glory, a crown of life rather in this case. Um, the word worker, as a proven worker, that's an interesting term, it's very generic, it just means a laborer, it's very vague, it doesn't speci specify any type of a worker. It's the same um, word that's used in Matthew 9, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. He's looking for workers, he's looking for laborers. He doesn't say to Timothy, I need theologians, I need priests, I need you know, all kinds of other things. I need laborers. I just need people who are ready and willing and able to work and provide their energy for my glory. Workers. And then it says, uh, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. What, what could cause Timothy or us to be ashamed? Well, number one, not to be a proven worker. When persecutions come and we avoid them, um, you know, that's something to cause a shame. Now, having said that, we remember the example of Peter. His first great trial was when Christ was being uh, examined by the high priest. And what did Peter do? He denied his Lord three times. And not in that, but in cursing in an oath. And then he stormed out he, crying. He was ashamed. Okay? What happened to Peter? Is that the end of Peter? No, you remember the, the little, um, the, the, few, the verses 11 to 13 that we read, when we are unfaithful, he is faithful. The Lord sought him out purposely to restore him back to that. And we know how Peter lived his life and ultimately gave his life. Um, we're told in some of the church fathers that he was crucified actually upside down because he didn't want to be, um, you know, didn't want to be the same way as the Lord exactly to take from his glory. So we know that he suffered and he died for Christ. So he, there was a time of stumbling, but he learned and he was restored and he became that proven worker. So that's a good example for us. Um, other things to be ashamed of, um, the testimony Paul mentions, don't be ashamed of the testimony of Christ or of Paul a prisoner for his sake. Um, ironically, Shame kind of is a cycle, isn't it? Have you ever tried to, or you ever had a, maybe a, an opportunity to witness someone and the Spirit was kind of speaking to you, saying you need to talk to this person, but you kind of resisted, and then by the time this person moved along, the opportunity was gone? You, I don't know, maybe I'm the only one that's ever happened to you, I don't know. But if you've missed an opportunity, really I missed the opportunity because I was ashamed of my Lord. I just wasn't, I just wasn't, uh, you know, bold enough and willing to accept whatever negative consequences, rejection, anger, whatever, at that time, I was ashamed of my Lord. But then guess what? I went away being ashamed. That's something to be ashamed of, isn't it? It's a cycle that keeps on going. Okay? Um, what else? Uh, Paul tells us that he is not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and salvation to the Jew first and to the Gentile next and so on. So we can be ashamed of the gospel and that again in turn is something that we'll be ashamed of later because it's God. Folks, if we've been saved by this very gospel, why would we be ashamed of? And yet we are sometimes. Um, he, uh, something that could cause Timothy shame is being exposed as a false teacher. We'll read later. Well, we'll see. I don't know if we're going to get there or not, but uh, in chapter 2, 17 and also verses 3, 8 and 9, Paul exposes false teachers, and there's names named in Scripture for all of eternity. Uh, we read the names of uh, Hymenaeus and Phil Philetus, or Philetus, however you want to pronounce it. Those names are in there as false teachers, and there's no further reference to them um, to say that they are reconciled at some date. Their names are in Scripture for all of eternity as false teachers. That would certainly be something to be terribly ashamed of. Now, Scripture is closed, the canon is, so that's not going to happen to us, but nonetheless, being exposed as someone who has taught something false is, uh, is not good. And of course, 
by the way, if you're uh, you know, teaching and, you, and you're starting off with 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, there's nothing more fearful than me <laughs> standing up here. I don't want to be exposed as a false teacher either. So if I have said something amiss, please let me know. Um, you know, one of the consequences of false teaching is spreading the infection. Paul compares it to an infection, even gangrene. And I know that there's nurses in the building here. I don't know if you've seen like active advanced cases of gangrene or not, but it's, I looked it up. It's not very, it's terrible. It's horrific. Okay, it often results in the loss of a limb and perhaps death. Um, it's very serious. Um, false teaching has that way of acting like an infection and undermining the faith of others. He might also be ashamed by not heeding Paul's exhortations in 2.14 or Paul's warnings in 2, uh, 22 to 24. Uh, keep away, reject, do not engage, and, and so on. So there's many things that can cause us shame. We, again, need to be diligent and careful about these things. And then finally, with uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, teaching the message of truth accurately. And the message of truth is uh, referred elsewhere as the, the word of truth or sound doctrine. Um, the word literally in Greek means healthy or hygienic. It's actually the, the Greek word uh, for sound is actually where we get our, our English word hygienic. It's clean. It's wholesome. It's, it's life building. It's... It's uh, sound, and uh, that's our message of truth. As opposed to the message of destruction, the one that spreads like a gangrenous infection in chapter 2.17 that can undermine faith. Um, this idea of accurately is really interesting when I looked it up, um, maybe because I have a construction background, um, but that word translated, teaching the message of truth accurately, you look in different translations, and it's to translate a lot of different ways. Um, rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, correctly handling the word of truth. In different ways. It gives scholars a little bit of trouble because the Greek term literally means cutting a straight road, which is a really interesting term. Uh, what was Paul referring to? Um, you know, Paul being, having traveled thousands of miles over Roman roads, he knew Roman roads. And there's a few little, uh, few little things, I don't think I have them listed here. Um, I'll just stop on this point for a moment. Um, yeah, the example of Roman roads, there was over 80,000 kilometers of Roman roads. Just think about that. In the, in the days before modern construction equipment, 80,000 kilometers of roads. They went as far as Great Britain. They went over the Western Europe, even in Eastern Europe. They went into the East as far as uh, you know, Syria, Iran, even Iraq, into North Africa, all through the Middle East. And these roads were known for several things. First of all, um, their quality. They were excellent. They were known actually to be straight. Maybe that's where this uh, word comes from. Romans, where they could, built them very straight. They didn't waste time. They try to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible. Um, their goal was, of course, military victory. Um, you know, I was listening to a military commentator recently, you know, with all these uh, conflicts in the world, and, and they said that uh, amateurs talk strategy, professionals talk logistics. Logistics wins wars. That's how the Romans gain victory, these straight roads that led all over the empire. As soon as they sent a legion out there, they were building a road behind them to support them, to reinforce them, and so on. And uh, so the roads were very uh, important for victory, and once they gained the victory, of course, prosperity was very, uh, uh, was, you know, ensued. And also the roads, many of them endure today. I know people, different people here, I know have traveled to the Middle East uh, and in uh, you know, Turkey and so on, they still can travel through Ro uh, Roman roads. Teaching the scriptures accurately in our case is vital for spiritual, spiritual victory and endurance. We need to cut a straight road. We need to teach doctrine that is true and that is sound, hygienic, healthy, and profitable for the hearers.
Our doctrine should not be a winding, rough, bumpy road full of potholes, washouts, and so on. It needs to be a straight path. So much to how do you build, and this is a bit of a sidebar, but how do you build a network of Roman roads before the advent of construction? Um, well, this is very similar, because our time is fleeting here, so we'll end in just a moment. Um, when I was in college, one of our professors liked to uh, write a question on the it was chalkboard back then, folks. Anyone know what a chalkboard is? They wrote on chalkboard a question. And we, there was one question one day. It says, how do you eat an elephant? And it was, you know, of course, obviously unrelated to uh, the course was manufacturing, planning, control systems. So what is how do you eat an elephant got to do with any of that? So we're all confused. And maybe someone's heard this proverb before. How do you eat an elephant? And so he comes in, we ask him, he says, one bite at a time. How do you build a network of Roman roads? Many laborers, one brick, one stone at a time. It might seem like a really challenging thing, even here in our country. I mean, you, look, um, you know, someone made the joke that when you turn on the news, someone says, uh, good evening, and then proceeds to tell you why it's not. It's nothing but bad news. There's nothing but bad news in our, our country right now as far as moral decay and, and so on. We see it happening. It can seem overwhelming. How do we build straight roads and win people? Many laborers, one stone, one brick at a time, and building as straight as we possibly can, not getting into side paths and twisting and turning, make it as straight as possible. Um, so it looks like our time has been far spent. We didn't get very far. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think we'll, we'll leave it here, unfortunately. Uh, we didn't get to our other points, maybe another time. Um, but there's been lots there. I, I kind of feared that I was telling Marcia yesterday that uh, I don't think we're going to get past 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. But anyhow, we'll, we'll do what we can. So I hope it's been profitable for you. Um, I encourage you to study the book of 2 Timothy. It's very relevant to our day and age that we are in. Um, very difficult times now, but even ahead um, as the world departs, especially the Western world departs from our traditional values and is more and more following the way of the God of this world. So um, let's just commit this time to the Lord and uh, we'll open it up for our break after. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this time we've been able to spend in your holy scriptures. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. We pray that he would be our teacher today, that he would take what we have meditated on and we're learning about, that he would uh, convince us of things that we need to learn and most importantly, the things we need to practice. And we pray that truly our doctrine would be your doctrine and not our own. And that Father, our doctrine would be our practice. There would be no separation. And in all things, Father, that, the, that we would glorify you, our God, our Creator, and also, of course, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, who died for us uh, to purchase us as a people for himself and to purify us. And so we pray, Father, for doctrinal purity. We pray that our practice would follow. And we also pray for moral purity. And we pray for help, Father, to living in dark days to shine brightly for our Savior and to do all that we can to build straight roads uh, to see many one to Christ during this very difficult time. And so, Father, we just again commit ourselves to you and pray your blessings upon all that we have considered today. We pray these things in the glorious and wonderful name of Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Many special thanks again to our dedicated AV team for their miracle working this morning. <laughs>